hi to you all. I'm Jazz, a GP in Villaverde in Madrid, and I participate in La Cabecera, that's a collective mainly formed by primary care professionals or people that feel close to that space politically. And it's basically a, an extra institutional place, um, completely self-organized, from which we allow ourselves to reflect and analyze and even try and impact maybe what's done within the institution. But we felt we needed that, that slight perspective or, or distance to look at it from, from outside to, to understand better what's going in, going on inside. And so the ideas that I'll be sharing, um, here today feed greatly from everything we've been thinking and imagining together in the past years. Also, I like to situate my discourse because even though I'm speaking in English, I've lived in Barcelona for over 10 years and I've just recently moved to Madrid. So my references and, and experiences are rooted in this, in this context. So I'm meant to talk about different uh, health models or healthcare system provision models. And the first thing that came to mind was that probably most of you have given a thought or two about different models possible and um, that there's definitely it's a topic that's definitely been in the spotlight in the last year for for obvious reasons and i'm going to frame it using four different axes but um for general modeling that's probably not going to be very revealing or anything new to most of you but i thought it was a good way to organize the ideas um in a way that would um allow for some questions to arise or knots that appear when when mapping the ideas in this way and also even questions that arise when we think about what we can do about it as health activists so I'll be stopping every now and then to share some of these questions or knots. I, I like to call them knots, not as in a way of getting stuck or in a mess or in a tangle, but as ways of thinking how different trains of thought can revolve around each other and tense each other, maybe changing positions or directions or impacting one another somehow. So we'll be stopping every now and then along the way on some of these knots. Okay, so I picked four axes and there could be infinite more and maybe even uh, a topic for the discussion afterwards could be what axis people come up with because depending on on what vectors we choose we can be imagining and thinking different models on depending on different variables so it's uh, an interesting question to pose the four that i picked were financing and provision of healthcare coverage the focus and then health subject and that would entail a different directionality maybe but we'll be going into it later in any case these axes aren't independent from each other they overlap and relate to each other and they could probably draw a diagram more like this one that you'll be seeing on the screen where depending on where we sit on each of the vectors we'd be covering or leaving out certain sectors of the population or reproducing even certain oppressions and violences or favoring some privileges um here we come across come across the first knot that i i thought of that was the fact that we name exclusion at least in spain it's a very prolific diagnosis the social problem on epicrisis and clinical histories but we don't tend to name privilege and the question is what political implications are there to name an exclusion and not privilege? What does it say about what we act on, what we think is problematic, what we are ready to put into the equation and what we're not ready to act on? So that would be like a first question there. And going on to the first axis, axis we'll be talking about financing and provision. Depending on how the healthcare is financed and the provision, organized will have public or private healthcare systems so financed by taxes by the people provided by the government that would be a public system that's good insurance or some private services people have to pay for and acquire from private companies that would be a private healthcare system that's bad so we all know it's not that simple and we have infinite examples on how in different countries public and private logics and organizations blend into each other in often very complicated sometimes very corrupt dangerous diagrams 
and that we haven't got time to go into detail here today and and it wouldn't be the topic but um but just to mention what i've had closest in the past years in catalonia only 25 percent of the health budget is destined to public companies providing healthcare. that means that there's a lot of money from public funds flowing freely into into private pockets and the implications of this aren't only economic an example very relevant at this moment and and a clear example of how this capitalism capitalist extractivism is is working and in good health enhancing private um, management of healthcare provision is the privatization of knowledge in the case of the vaccine pa patents so we've got a pharmaceutical industry that has privatized the knowledge of our own bodily functions and is making an outrageous profit of the sale of vaccines in a treacherous deal that we now have so that we now have a two-colored world map where it depends on what hemisphere you are now north or south you're going to be getting the vaccine or not in spain we say get bad buddy that what an atrocity this is Another example on another scale, but another barbaridad, all the same, is in Madrid, for a woman to freely interrupt her pregnancy, she has to be referred to a private practice. It's free of cost for her, but not to the system. And in any case, what does it say symbolically if we are referring somebody to a private practice for an abortion? Because that's something that's just not done in the public health care. So here comes a knot, another one, in reference to this axis. I mentioned before how the healthcare system has been under the spotlight in this last year. So everybody became epidemiologists all of a sudden. I had to go through my cumulative incidents notes from the degree or whatever. And, um, and the thing is, this hasn't brought on a critical analysis and I'm generalizing now because there have been some notes in this line but my feeling it's is that they've been very much on the margins of public discourse or even in the context of social movements but the authority of healthcare officials and the healthcare discourse is is not disputed if not in the grounds of pretty crazy and not very exciting conspiracy theories so this is a question as someone who's never enjoyed the discursive and practical authority given to healthcare officials or healthcare systems over the social body, how can we dispute certain practices and the authority the healthcare institutions now enjoy without feeding into forces that are trying to dismantle it or profit from it? We are sometimes so protective of the public sphere of our healthcare system. We feel it's so frail and so precious at the same time that we are wary of criticism. We have to be allowed to critically analyze without that reverting in reinforcement of private models. There has to be place for mutation, a transformation, advance within what we have left of the public healthcare system precisely because in our experience, this is the best way of ensuring the best and more just healthcare for all. Now we go on to the next axis that would be focus on organizational logics. And depending on, on this, we'll think of health systems with the hospital in the center with a centralized organizational logic. Um, understanding the hospitals as a place where there are a series of pre-established services where healthcare is compartmentalized literally into different body parts, liver here, heart there, kidneys, wherever. And surrounding the hospitals, we'd have small health centers with not much protagonism, no coordination between each other. And that would basically serve as a sieve or a filter function for who gets the best, who gets to get seen in the hospital or gets sent back home. And nobody denies that the hospital and focal specialists are completely necessary. But when a healthcare system revolves on a hospital centered logic, budget wise and organizationally, what we have is a less cost efficient system that emphasizes inequity. And even sometimes some articles I've shown transversally increases mortality. And there are evidence of these three facts, less cost efficient, unfair and potentially mortal. Luckily, there are other possibilities. These are, you've 
have on the mid on the on the screens the three diagrams Paul Baran describes um, uses to describe the functioning of social media, but they're pretty simple and useful for um, to think around different organizational logics in any system, I think. So we've talked about the centralized model, and in the middle we've got the decentralized model, where we can see that there are still hospitals, but the other health centers gain more protagonism, distributed and articulated with the territory. This would allow for elements that um, aren't only diagnosis anymore or body parts to come into the equation and it would allow for a more integrated approach to health adopting another attitude. Let's focus maybe on the biomedical paradigm or in any case at least putting that paradigm in relation to why and where it's happening. So we could approach a problem or a situation and intervene on the wider picture. It could be possible even to reorganize services guided by the needs detected because you're where you're you're there and you're seeing it you're in you're in conversation with with the communities and with the territory so you're not just working with a set of pre-established services of compartmentalized bodies and this is a model and this model is what's been called for in Alma Ata, in Astana, in the Ottawa letters for the past 40 years. Even the OMS suggests that 25% of health budget should be destined to primary care services. In Spain, even though the model is meant to be similar to this decentralized one, when it comes to facts, it's far from true. We do have a network of primary healthcare centers and facilities where we have nurses, GPs, but also social workers, physios, gynecology, midwifery, psychology, pediatrics. Um, but in best of cases, it counts with a 17% of the budget. That's in Andalucía, in Catalonia, it's 14%. In Madrid, it's barely 11%. But if there's a graphic that I think represents the scale of the problem, it's one that you can see on the right of the screen now. And this is the total health budget in blue in relation to the percentage destined to primary care in red. It only reaches 2015, but the gap just keeps on widening in further years. And this image is really the story of a re-centralization of a public healthcare system turned into a less cost efficient, inequity enhancing and potentially more mortal model. And during this last year of pandemic, this has also been the tendency. So we've been closing, closing healthcare centers and redirecting the professionals to hospital care facilities and improvised field hospitals. And I'm not saying that more staff wasn't needed in these services, but I'm saying that deciding that they were going to come from primary care was a political decision that we're still paying the consequences for. It meant letting go. It meant losing touch with the people, individuals and communities. There was a, there was a meme that was sent out from, from different social movements during the hardest part of the, of the lockdown here that was calling us to not let go no nos soldamos, it said. And it was a response to the way in which we were all you know, sent home to deal with the situation and an extremely indiv individualist approach to, to what coping is and how it can be done. And if there is a lesson to be learned from feminism, and I think there's, there's lots, it's that coping isn't an individual action. Um, on the image again, you'll be seeing some of the consequences of these other dimensions of the pandemic that aren't just the respiratory distress. So we see um, a study that was that was published lately that shows the patterns of cumulative incidents in Barcelona during the two waves of the pandemic. And especially in the second wave, we see that the incidence was inversely proportional to income. So poorer districts were seeing much higher incidence. And that's a picture of what we didn't manage to do from the healthcare system and social services. We weren't able to ensure the material living and working conditions these people needed to protect themselves from the virus, obviously, because if not, the incidence wouldn't be changed, wouldn't be different in the different districts or would be more similar to the first wave that were more similar between each other. 
And in this next study we see that was also published recently was a questionnaire sent out where we saw that women and young people, this is the conclusion, women and young people had worse mental health outcomes during the lockdown. So what are we going to do about that? What Have we done anything about that? Are we going to do anything about that? And, and these questions lead me to the next knot because following the idea of not letting go in the healthcare system, I think not letting go is at least in part to not let primary care close down. Understanding that healthcare is to take care and that it has to be done from close by to understand and pick up on what's happening and the ways in which the virus is impacting the day to day of people's lives and health in all its dimensions and complexity not only when they come into respiratory distress. But not only, we can't just pick up on the problem and stop there, describe it, and research it and publish it in papers and not intervene. What does not letting go mean in terms of healthcare system in a situation like the one we've been through in the last year? The third one for now would be um, the healthcare coverage so who and what parts of who are we covering with our health system according to what model we follow. And there have always been barriers to the access to healthcare system, greatly due to the different ways in which we reproduce inequity and discrimination, we're systematically reproducing excluding dynamics within the system as well as in the access to the system. And maybe within it in ways that are more subtle, but they're very they're also very dangerous and harmful. But the thing is that in Spain, since 2012, this exclusion to the access to healthcare services is abided by law. In 2012, a law was passed that changed our healthcare system from a universal coverage, at least in appearance, to one that followed the logic of a public insurance policy that you gained access to depending on your contribution to the social security. This law was rewritten in 2018, but in such a mischievous and Machiavellic way that we now have a law that's called the law of universal access, but that has just made it more difficult for some migrant communities to be able to access. This, these next images, on the left we have um, the, the, the banner for an exhibit that opened about a year ago just before the pandemic on the wonders of the supposed universal access of the Catalan healthcare system. Tremendously hypocritical because at the same time they tried to pass an instruction to legally prosecute migrants trying to fraud their access to healthcare. So either you have a universal healthcare system where people don't have to fraud their access into it or you don't have a universal healthcare system and people are having to fraud it and you're legally prosecuting them that's well something doesn't seem very much in line there and um and what we have on the right is literally and in these images is literally and symbolically the other side of the picture and it's a campaign led by Yossi Sanidad Universal that's a platform that advocates for universal healthcare since the 2012 law. And the name is literally I'm for universal healthcare. And they've now launched a campaign to take the government to court for the exclusion cases that the current law prompts. And then just as a detail, because I quite I find it quite bizarre how we still have a healthcare system that excludes whole communities and then only covers for certain bits of the bodies that it does tend to. So we have certain corporeal territories that aren't covered for, say feet. Only diabetics have free access to podologists and only once a year or short sighted eyes have to care for themselves and teeth can only be taken out and not fixed in the public system constraining the poor to toothlessness in my health center i work in a underprivileged peripheral district in madrid i can tell who works there and who's a patient just by lowering their face mask and taking a look at the mouth this is also part of what a discriminatory health care model looks like and here I, I found two knots that I thought it was interesting to pose. In On one hand, in what moment did the claim to the right to health, el derecho a la salud, 
become a claim to access healthcare services. And all in a very, cons very consumerist terms and mercantile language where patients become users and their rights become those of customers. These terms, the terms of the right to health and the right to healthcare access um, have converged into a one only idea when the right to health includes a right to access healthcare services, but at the same time overflows that idea impl and implies a whole lot more. So how can we think of the right to health and not only in terms of the right to access healthcare services from health activism and even from within the healthcare systems? And then a second knot here is, um, is the fact that we often use utilitarian arguments to defend certain people's rights to access healthcare services. People have a right to health and healthcare services, whether or not that is more cost efficient for the system. And the great danger of using these arguments when they are true is what happens if at any given moment they aren't? What happens if we've defended this right based on it being better for the general economy if suddenly it isn't? So now I'd go on to the fourth axis that is slightly more abstract and that depends on how we conceptualize health and therefore the health subject and therefore the directions, possible directions of our actions. One can think of health in terms of a natural, unique, universal, hegemonic state. That would be of somebody with two arms, two legs, thin, white, that can hear and see perfectly, this, preferably male, heterosexual, in a monogamous relationship, fertile, able-bodied, rich, or at least not poor, that doesn't suffer from anxiety or sadness, and definitely doesn't hear voices, doesn't smoke or drink or take illegal drugs. I could probably go on here for a while. And under this idea, there's only one way of being healthy, from which we distance ourselves temporarily, becoming ill. A temporary defect, a momentaneous lack, where the healthcare system steps in to restore that state of complete physical, mental, and social well being the OMS goes on about. So, the healthcare system here would be prescribing and restoring once again that one and only natural state of complete well being. This is the way I reckon our practice within the healthcare system is thought and organized, at least in my experience. And it's very problematic because there isn't one unique universal form of health. It isn't an individual state and it isn't something we temporarily lose. Our well-being is collective, not individual. It's a capacity, not a natural and unique state. And it's in continuous construction. It's a collective capacity that we are sustaining all the time. Thinking of it in these terms, healthcare isn't just something that's provided from an institutional dimension anymore. And here we come back to that third diagram of um, Paul Baran, of a distributed mesh representing all those alliances and informal networks that exist and make life livable, that have to do with friendship and caring and dynamics, um, caring dynamics that is, and interdependence even with other organisms and environments that sustain us in, in a big ecosystem. If we dared to reconceptualize health this way, the model of healthcare system it could give way to would be one that's articulated with the community, but not to prescribe that static state of well-being. We think of people drifting apart of commandeering and controlling social dynamics. It could be articulated with the community to listen, accompany and stand by and make ourselves available in so far as part of that collective process health is. And here there's a quote by Rita Serrato that's a Argentinian feminist anthropologist um, that I think refers and reflects this idea in a very poetic and inspiring way. Um, I've translated it myself, that's a bit complicated, but I think the idea comes across well. And she says that we have to open breaches in the walls of what is sayable and sustain that space, but not as tutors, if not guarding them as escape lines for what hasn't been said, 
for what was silenced. That's where the bodies appear with their narrations about themselves and about us. And then what if for once we brought the baddies into the picture? Because maybe there's something we can do about that. So institutional racism, sexism, trans homophobia, evictions and laws that protect the big tenants, capitalism, patriarchy, pharmaceutical industry and the patent policies, the labor market, all forms of exploitation and oppression. These are all elements that undermine and suppress communities and individuals' health. So maybe could we think of a healthcare system that had its aim and its actions moving towards curing cancer and treating hypertension, but also advocating for new housing policies that ensured that nobody was left homeless, or fought for that world map of vaccination rates not to be two different colours depending on the hemisphere. Or if not, at least a system capable of revising in what way it's taking part in that undermining and health suppressing dynamic. So these are four possible axes, four shifts, I think, that are key in working towards a model of healthcare that doesn't reproduce discrimination and injustice, that could even aspire to an emancipatory idea of health far from that individualizing, oppressive, universalizing idea we've been imposing so long. Sometimes the scale of it triggers a block, a standstill, silence while all this apparatus carries on rolling without tensions the inertia is so strong we find it difficult to veer its direction at those moments i think it's interesting to first to listen because there's a lot being said out there and then to downscale following those claims generate undercurrents from different points within the system, each of us starting to shake, activating our imagination, the desire for change, and not by ourselves, collectively, thinking and drawing these new horizons in ways which affect us and the way we practice, and at the same time generating effects, movements, shifts, vibrations, and on the long run, lawsuits, new patent policies, constituent processes, like in Chile. The silenced bodies speak and refuse to disappear. New healthcare models become possible. <laughs>